on the podcast today, we have John Luptemeyer. John is a wonderful advocate for the youth today in youth hockey. Uh, wonderful guy. Uh, Dan, what would you take away from this one? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. So this podcast we recorded a couple weeks ago and it inspired my blog post on uh, Hockey's Arsenal to write about the ADM, the American Development Model, and how cross-ice hockey, uh, as he, you know, is a huge proponent of, I am too. And so I thought, in addition to what he talks about on here, that I would try to, you know, get something up on, on our end and kind of uh, get the good word out. So thank you, John, for sparking that really insightful interview. I really enjoy the fact that, that John is just a passionate hockey dad. Like, at the end of the day, like, what is better than a good passion hockey pair um, and just finding success with his passion and just going out, finding the answers and just implementing it and being consistent and how much success he's had, how much fun he's had. Like I can't think of, any, like, he just is so passionate. It radiates through the microphone. I, I wanted to reach through the, the zoom screen and literally like give him a hug. Like I'm excited. I want to play for you. I don't, I'm not even eight years old and I still want to play for you. Like just sounds like everything he does is a ton of fun um, and when you're having fun, we know we're developing and getting better and, and just enjoying the game. Like why you play the game, boom, have fun. Couldn't, couldn't ask for a better episode. Uh, we get into a lot, a lot of specifics. This is perfect for any parent, player, coach, casual fan, whatever. You're, you're going to get excited. The passion just comes through in his voice. It's beautiful. Without further ado, John Luke DeMeyer. On today's podcast, we have John Luke DeMeyer. Tough last name to get. Glad I nailed that one. So we're off to a strong start. Um, John, I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, obviously, you've been in youth hockey for quite some time. Uh, I think it's very cool that you're going to give a perspective more so from a parent that got involved. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. You you guys are obviously doing your homework. If you're finding any material that I'm involved in, it's probably <clears throat> YouTube videos that are at least five years old. So you are digging deep. Well done. Greg is a digger. Why don't you, for those of uh, our audience members who might not know your story, just give us a quick background on how you got involved with the game of hockey and, and where we are now. Yeah, so, uh, you know, grew up playing in St. Louis, Missouri in the late 70s, early 80s. I'm 51 and uh, love the game, played in high school, played a little bit club in college. And, um, you know, and then like so many of us went, went about, life and then got back involved, moved back to the same town that I grew up in, Kirkwood, Missouri, uh, when my oldest child was born. And at five years old, he wanted to do hockey. We got, we got him to learn to play. And then, um, you know, I've been, I've been with the club for 17 years now, either as a, a coach on the coaches committee, coaching director or on the board. And uh, all those, all those at, at various times or simultaneously, um, just as a volunteer. So really that's the reason that I am on is because I want to let any parent know if you have an idea, it, it, it can be intimidating if you're not a professional, if you're not the paid coaching director, if you're not a university graduate in sports science to get involved, it, it doesn't take that. It just takes a good idea and some passion. Awesome stuff. And I'm, I'm excited to dig into that further, but I, I, there's one story I'd love to hear about. And I think this will lead kind of into our, our next part of the conversation here. Uh, story about your nephew, Cooper. From, from my research here, he was about to quit all of these sports, but uh, you guys kept him in hockey and now he's a lifelong fan. We decided we wanted to go all in on what USA Hockey was promoting at that time, which wasn't even called the American Development Model yet. And um, we were a typical club, full ice from 6U to, to you know, 18U. Um, each team given their own ice, their puck bag, their team, and the coach sent on their merry way. And we were having disastrous results as a club. And um, that was continuing, you know, as I started and, and uh, came across this, this whole cross ice format, station-based practices and a lot of stuff that is probably, you know, relatively obvious now, but 15 years ago, not so much. And um, 
I convinced the board that that we needed to take a stab at this. We couldn't get any worse doing things in a traditional model. And um, we had a couple town hall meetings and uh, shared with the parents that we were literally pulling out of the Missouri Hockey League at the 6U and 8U level and running our, our own cross ice league in-house because none of the other clubs were ready to go that route yet. Cooper, my nephew, was uh, one of the kids caught in the trap, meaning the year prior he was a full ice player and, and he was going to be in this group that was switching to cross ice. And as you can imagine, a lot of anxiety. And he hadn't had a lot of success in other sports uh, to the point where he's eight and he's already quit baseball and he's already quit soccer and basketball wasn't a good fit. And, and my sister comes to me and says, John, you're killing me. We convinced Cooper to give hockey one more season because he wanted to quit that too. And now you're making him play cross ice. Like it's not even the game that the grownups play. And, um, and I said, Mary Beth, trust me, it's going to work. And then I, I prayed a lot. And I said, please, I hope this works. Um, and it worked. And, and everyone knows the benefits now. Every kid's scoring four and five goals a game. And the touches are way up. And the energy is phenomenal in the building. And everyone's loving it. And I came in uh, to one of the games. We were on the ice after him. And I asked my sister, uh, how's the game going? She's like, oh, it's great. as a, you know, He's got four goals just like every other kid out there. So when he came off the ice, I go, Cooper, I heard you scored four goals today. And he goes, I know. I didn't know how I got so good. And I just died laughing. And this kid thinks he's amazing. And we want every kid to think that at 8U. And I thought you were going to have to kick me or drag me out of here kicking and screaming for this program not to continue when I see kids like that who – we're ready to give up the game and now have so much passion for it. He uh, didn't make varsity until senior year of high school. Uh, he, he even was, was playing club, uh, playing men's league in college because he couldn't make the club team at that, at that school and will play adult beer league. He will uh, be a, a season ticket holder for the NHL. He'll be an amazing coach. And, you know, USA Hockey won. They, they almost lost that kid, and now they got a lifer. I love that story. It's not just for the top end, kids, parents, et cetera. You know, it's all, all about everyone and making everyone love the game. And we have a small enough community as it is. We don't need to be making it smaller on our own. Uh, <laughs> so, I remember being at a USA Hockey Clinic a few years ago, and uh, one of the presentations that stuck with me uh, and I've heard this since a few times, is that your main role as a coach at like the 8U, 10U level isn't to make sure that the player, you know, plays double A next year or anything like that. It's to make sure that they come back to hockey next year. And I think that's something that like always is stuck with me. So yeah, sorry, Greg, go ahead. S similar okay. theme here, uh, but we, yeah. we have a local league and it's called the Slacker Hockey League. And it's just out of this small rink on the east side. It probably pushed away because everyone has these leagues, A, A and B leagues. But this is like the D and E league. And it's <laughs> mostly parents that their kids played and they wanted to get involved a little bit. So uh, not great hockey at all, but they're tailgating, enjoying life. It's awesome. Absolutely yeah. love it. The, the, uh, we, have, we have a joke in the club that um... – learn to play the kids play for free and we charge the parents to come out and help because they have more fun than the kids do. Hell yeah. Love that. Love that. Um, but, but going back to even getting the change of starting um, and, and going through those, what were the key items you needed to educate the parents on? Cause obviously there's going to be some pushback from here's what we've always been doing. Uh, obviously it's probably easier in your perspective because things weren't going well for the club as a whole, but just the education piece and getting the key people on board. Well, uh, we were blessed at the time with, with a board that uh, agreed that, you know, I mean, let's not dance around it. We were terrible. Our club's winning percentage was 350 as a club. And that was still having a few teams were, you know, contending for league championships. So most of our teams were like 200. So we had a board that said, if you're crazy enough to try something else, we'll, we'll support you. And um, 
then it was doing the research, uh, which again was a little harder at that time than it is now. USA Hockey is an amazing uh, organization in terms of of giving you the the resources you need now to get to get going. But doing the research on what's what's a better way, and then uh, we had town hall meetings where we laid out the plan, what we're going to do, why we think we're doing it, and then you know yeah, it took some heat from some parents with some anxiety who, um, you know, felt like full ice hockey, uh, out, the benefits of full ice outweighed the benefits of cross ice. And again, probably not as hard now, but whatever it is that you're tackling, if it's something different than that, point being, just put our plan out there. Parents, in all fairness to them, I think they get, they get colored poorly. They're trying to connect the dots. And to your point, that slacker league is full of a whole bunch of parents who are first timers. Their kids started playing and now they're playing. They don't know what they're watching at practice. They don't know what, what, what is an effective uh, drill or season. They're, they're trying to connect the dots. So give them the information so they connect the right dots. Otherwise they're going to make some assumptions on their own and they're almost always wrong. So just embrace them, give them the information, take the questions don't be insulted by it. Um, educate as best you can. And then at some point you recognize if someone is still making noise, if they're not going to be satisfied and it's just time to move forward. Um, so we did that. And then, um, you know, in, in hindsight, there was a really fortunate compromise that was made that allowed us to do so much more the following season. And that was we, we have to every team, two thirds of their games were cross ice and one third were full ice. It was a compromise, but it wasn't like two, the first two thirds of the season and the last third, they were intermingled all throughout. And so parents would come into the rink and the cross ice games would be going on and then they'd get on for the full ice game. And, and immediately parents could see the difference in the energy. And, and so by January, we had families requesting, can we stop playing full ice and just switch to the cross ice? So if, if, if that applies to someone with an idea out there, if there's some sort of hybrid model, we did it in baseball uh, with little ones where it was like we wanted machine pitch and everyone's in a rush to kid pitch. So we did two leagues and you saw the difference in the intensity uh, between the two leagues and parents are like, oh my God, let's stop doing kid pitch, you know? Um, so I, I don't know if that's applicable across um, all the spectrums, but the point is put a plan together, do your research, present it honestly and upfront, embrace the questions, answer them as best you can, and then uh, assess how things are going and adjust as necessary. I'm interested in your perspective as a parent. You've said a few times now, um, we were talking offline before, just for our listeners, that you know, some of these changes might be more well-received today than they had been, say, a generation ago. Is there anything that you're seeing today that you think, you know, fast forward 10 years, we'll be able to say like, yeah, that was so obvious. Why weren't we doing that in 2021? Um, well, yeah, yeah, all we have to do is look to Finland and Sweden and go, uh, why aren't we doing that? So if I had my dream scenario, so, so just a, a little more background. So Kirkwood is a model association. There's only 25 in the country. Uh, that's, that's, that's really disappointing that we don't have more people embracing what USA Hockey is espousing because the results for our club have been insane. Uh, double the winning percentage. Our club is two and a half times as big as it was 10 years ago. Um, we, we have more state championships than any other club in Missouri hockey, more league championships. And it's not because we are training in a traditional way we're just making better players and then letting them play so um so the station-based practices and cross ice through eight you in in my mind we've got some associations washington alaska that have already embraced half ice for 10 you i'd love to see us get there and uh and then maybe even a little bit of a hybrid model at 12 you but but for for me the dream club at 6U, it's quarter ice, one-on-one -on -one even, maybe two-on-two. -two. At 8U, it would be cross ice, and, and maybe we could even squeeze four games in cross ice ways, three-on-three. -three. At 10U, it would be half ice, four-on-four. -four. 
And then at 12, you, you would, you would get into the traditional hockey. I would love it if 15 years from now, we're like, what were we worried about with those changes at 10 U and 12 U? Yeah. I remember seeing the Swedish proposal. I think they even went down to, uh, they cut the ice in half and then cut it in half again. And they had two games on there and it was even smaller for the youngest ages. Uh, I'll have to pull that up at some point and put that yeah. in the show notes, but uh, it, it's quite something. And then, uh, they, I know they've been doing a lot of like handbooks. So, you know, how do you go back onto defensive retrieval and things like that? So there's so many ways you can do it with the station-based practices, like you're talking about it's super exciting stuff all about that. I think we, we still have a long way to go. I think we've oh, got yeah. a good start. Uh, and maybe what are some of those changes? Cause that was, you know, 15 years ago when you started doing this, you know, you're looking back now and you've got some nice hindsight, you know, what, what kind of things would you be changing or wanting to be do? Uh, wanting to do differently uh you mean compared if, if i were starting now instead of 15 years ago what would i do a little different yeah basically what have you learned from the past yeah. and think that this is now best in class and i was an idiot back then and yeah, yeah. we all were yeah. oh boy was i an idiot still am one of the things that i find amazing about what happened we focused on making better players, as I said. It, every, every decision we made was how do we make a better practice experience for our players? How do we make a better game experience? And it was all focused on the kids on ice. And what I never um, expected to see happen was the culture change for our organization for the adults. So it's something that I would focus on now. And, and here's, here's how it evolved. Coaches, instead of you having your own team, now I'm coaching a station and multiple teams come through. I care about all the kids in my division. When another team goes to a tournament and wins, I feel like I have some skin in that game. There's an esprit de corps amongst our coaches that I think is, is, was never intended and is so healthy. Um, this format also leads to more teams on the ice, more players on the ice. That means more parents in the stands. They all get to know each other. It, you know, it's not your team here and my team down there. They're all intermingled because kids are rotating everywhere and our parents get to know each other and there's more of a sense of connectedness among the parents. And then they're watching the practices and every kid's running through a station doing the same drills. Now it's, I'm not so worried about what team I'm on because all of the kids, I, I don't know what I'm watching or I may not even agree with it, but everybody's getting the same treatment. And so uh, there's a sense of community in our organization that at, is, is phenomenal and it worked out. But looking back in hindsight, I would, I, would, I would do more to craft that culture from the beginning, I think, because it's amazing what it allows us to do now. As far as actual changes, we spent so much time coming up with drills to execute our edge work and all the technical stuff that's out there that is really appropriate for very elite tier one, 14U and up type players. And, and I have evolved now to a coach and Bob Mancini with USA Hockey told me this last time he was in town. I loved it. He goes, however little you can talk during a practice, it can always be less. And so for me, it's about creating games, small area games. I'm obsessed with small area games and allowing the game to give the kids feedback and to teach them themselves. I just manipulate the parameters of the game so that they discover how to play. So we'd be so much better off now if 15 years ago we still, we, we, we shrunk it into small areas and we had some battle drills, but everything was still too rigid and structured. It should be a lot more chaotic and organic. And that, that would be a change that if I were starting now, that's, that's where I'd, I'd start from the beginning. All right. I got a question that's a little uncomfortable because I've had similar experiences, I think, to what it sounds like you've had with Kirkwood. So your goal is to create the best players possible, right? And when you right. do that, inherently, some of these players are going to look for greener pastures. How do you reconcile <laughs> How do you reconcile that? Obviously, oh. we want what's best for our kids long term, yes. um, but there is an inherent it. conflict of interest in your coach. Yeah, Dan, it's a wonderful question because I struggled with it for a decade. Other teams were just cherry picking our players and then claiming they were, you know, that they were good at development because they were our kids. And I'm like, 
don't you get it? That happened because you were here. Why are you leaving? So here, here's my advice in that situation. That was my ego because I wanted my club to be better and, and win so that I could prove that, that the way we were training was better. It, it, it's such a waste of time. I, all I want to do now is be a kid's favorite adult who's not named mom or dad in their life. They can go play at another club. I don't care. I want to impact every child to be the most wonderful person that they've ever dealt with. And, and if, if they choose to, to still leave, good luck to that coach in beating me at that because I'm coming with more energy. I'm coming with more love. I'm coming with more patience. And I'm that, that's my scoreboard. If they want to go somewhere else, um, I wish they would more often ask for advice because candidly, we would tell them when it's time to go. Um, but but most uh, do have a sense of anxiety and not wanting to miss the boat. And so uh, here's what I can tell you to, to, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have any short answers, but we were less than 300 kids and, and, and fading fast. We were in discussions with the, the next town overs club to merge because that's how bad our numbers were getting. We developed more kids now than ever that leave our club and we're still two and a half times as big as we were. If you, if you have a great product, it sells itself. We, we, our parents are at their soccer fields, basketball courts in the, at, at recess at, at, uh, you know, trivia nights bragging about how much fun they have in the hockey experience. So if someone doesn't want to be there, let them go. <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line is, um, I wish they would stay. I wish them the best of luck if, if they need to go. Well, well that's uh, leading into kind of my next question, maybe not directly, but very indirectly, of how do you define success? Um, and, and do you let the parents kind of say, I like this, I don't like this? Or are you having your own parameters on, here's what we're looking to accomplish, here's how you should grade us uh, and the job that we're doing? Yeah. So, um, you know, and that, that's going to evolve over time. So, uh, you know, when we were starting the changes that we made, we had to re-educate parents. And so we gave them very specific things. If, if this is an all in, intramural league and we're not keeping score, that's a natural thing that, that parents are going to use to decide whether or not our team is better than another team is the scoreboard. So we had to educate them on, this is what we are working on now. So these are the things that you could look for at practice and measure. Um, we did some very specific um, analysis, time trials, if you will, beginning a season and end of season as, as proof of concept early on. None of that happens now, frankly, because of the years of, of uh, uh, what, I would, what I would call uh, credit that we, that we have. It's, it's pretty indisputable now that that this works so um so success for me for what we tell our coaches success should be now is you have that parent meeting at the beginning of the season and you lay out how they should hold you accountable whether that's communication with you whether that's mid-season evals for the kids um you should be sending regular communications ideally weekly if not bi-weekly Here's what we were working on. Here's how I saw it manifest itself in the game. Again, it gets back to that parents connecting the dots. If, if they don't know what uh, you're doing, then they're going to make assumptions. And so you need to tell them what you're doing so they can hold you accountable. Um, you know, this, this last year or the year before last, I coached Bantam B. We were still rotating positions. Um, they're B hockey players, for goodness sakes. Um, I know they're 13 and 14, but <laughs> they're still pretty remedial. So, yes, parents, we just lost a game five to one. Everybody had just rotated to a new position. We were out of position. We'll play that team again in four games, everyone in these positions, and let's see how much closer the game is compared to last time. Like, just, you know, the stuff you, you analyze naturally as a coach – Share that with them and say, here's what, here's what I'm worried about. And, and, and again, some are going to disagree and say it's got to be about the scoreboard. Um, again, what I have found is the more I communicate, 
the, the less noise people make who disagree with me because they give up. I'm not going to convince John that he's wrong, even though I'm open-minded. What they want to do is go backwards, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> but they say there is, it is undeniable there is rationale. The man has, has a plan or a belief system and is, and is living by it. It, it, that teach their own on what they want to use. I'm just suggesting you need to tell your parents what to measure you on. And if you don't, then they're going to use the scoreboard and whether or not the, the kid's happy when he gets in the car. And as we all know, the, the translation from what happened in the locker room to what gets told in the car on the way home can be pretty significant. So um, the parents need to hear from you directly. That's awesome. And I found the same thing. The, there's a direct correlation between communication and parent satisfaction. And there's, yeah. there's no doubt in my mind that they're absolutely correlated. A hundred percent. And and now in fairness, we win a lot. And so we start with, with parents being happy. I get that. But um, if you, if you look at, you know, parent feedback at the end of the season and we do, the club does survey our parents. Those are the two things. Those are absolutely every year, the two things you can go back to that coach and look at their record and then also ask them how often they communicated and a sample of their emails to parents. And, and it's a hundred percent. Um, those two, those two things are, are the most critical for successful, uh, relationship with the, with the, uh, adults on the team. Wonderful. Well, I've got some follow-up questions on some things you touched on earlier. Uh, one was about practice being chaotic rather than structured. Um, and and wh why is that and why you believe that? Obviously through games, it's going to be more chaotic than if you're doing a assembly line type drill. Yes. So I, um, several things, There's so much there. Uh, and cut me off if you have to, you know, <laughs> we'll have a three hour podcast. But um, I, this, first of all, this isn't a sport like football. It's a very read react invasion sport. So why wouldn't you make practice look as much like the game as possible? Um, you can, the kids, uh, there's a lot of research out there that it's, it's, it's not considered a skill until they can apply it in a game setting. So, you know, I, cones have, I, I, I've evolved in my thinking to realize weaving through a cone is still not the same thing as weaving through kids in, in a, in a, in a game like scenario. So, um, so there's that. The other thing that I thought about, and I find it very ironic, um, this is the Hockey IQ podcast. I used to think you couldn't teach Hockey IQ. Now I believe that you can't teach it, but you can create an environment where they develop it. And that happens from the decision-making. And if, if I'm in, in a rote drill, I'm on autopilot. If, if, if I'm told we're playing three on three and, and you have to make two passes before you can shoot, that kid's got to make 10 decisions in those 30 seconds instead of zero decisions. All of those decisions, getting them right and getting them wrong, are developing their hockey IQ. And the last thing I'll say about chaos that I find probably the most beneficial is by, by well, it, it's, it, it takes two things, creating a chaotic environment and then shutting your mouth. Um, if you're barking instruction the whole time, you might as well be doing a drill because you're just trying to accomplish a drill in a chaotic environment. Let the game teach the kids how to play. And if you're pulling a kid aside and saying, hey, what do you see in there? You know, teach the kids who are, who are next in line. First of all, you'll get them to watch more. But for me, it all leads to this moment. I've won every year when we're doing a drill and I get sidetracked talking to a player and kids who are next in line start the drill on their own. That's when I know, all right, they feel empowered. This is their team. Their coach John's distracted. He talks too much. He's always distracted. So we are just going to go. And I'm not afraid of him blowing a whistle or yelling at me. It, it's, it's our turn that the, you know, the last group was over that, can happen in, in lines, but it happens way more frequently in, in scenarios. I love it. We don't even tell the kids who's going. We're doing a three on three game. You guys figure out who's up. And, and then you'll see kids going, Hey, it's your turn. Go with three on two out there right now. 
And um, all of that kind of chaos leads to, in games, I hear better analysis from players talking to each other on the bench, analyzing, trying to figure out uh, what's working and what isn't. So that chaos and me stepping back and closing my mouth and giving them the game uh, is certainly um, all, all kind of mixed together as to what I consider chaos. It's, it's not only a chaotic environment in terms of what you're watching, but so little instruction that kids have to decipher things on their own. I love it too when kids come up with cheats, when you create a game and then some kid figures out the way to jump it and he's, you know, bing, bing, and he's got two goals. And you're like, okay, we got to make a rule. Timmy just figured out how to beat this game. Um, that That's thinking. That's hockey IQ. I, I love when my kids totally blow up my drills. Uh, but I usually find it's the exact opposite. Um, they need almost that permission to test the boundaries a little bit more, especially at the younger ages. Uh, once they hit the teenage years, they seem to uh, push the envelope naturally. But otherwise, yeah. it's like a permission to – try things um or like you said like if i'm talking to someone like it's okay to do it and i actually yeah. have conversations around this like i want you guys to be able to take this and a lot of my drills that i've been doing are getting to the point where it's coachless i just have an ipad on the ice i set it up here's what we're doing guys have at it yeah and 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 so i think what you're up against is the fact that they're getting too much instruction elsewhere coach for the other sports uh activities that they're in is, is very much um, in charge and you're trying to create a free environment. And so they're trying to learn to adjust. Well, I can, I can practice this way with, with uh, Greg, but when I'm on this other team, I got to practice this way. And then you also do have uh, very much the rule followers who are like, Hey, you said the game is exactly this. And that person's not doing that. And, you know, um, and that's okay too. They're just, uh, they're very caught up on on the specifics of the game, and um, you got to try and help them learn to uh, to figure out what the point of not not the rule, but the spirit of 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 the intention. Yeah, I call that uh, commander's intent. You need to have the <laughs> idea of what the commander wants you to to be doing, and then you can execute. But uh, yeah, that, exactly. that, that's a history lesson for another day. <laughs> uh, but. Um, no, that's, that's, this is great stuff. Um, and uh, one area I think that a lot of, air, a lot of programs get wrong, and I've, I've heard you talk about briefly, uh, is the importance of, of doing some dry land and off ice, uh, whether that be video um, or just like stick handling before or whatever that off ice workout happens. But it's usually an issue. Do we do it on another day? Like, how does that operate for you? How do you see that fitting and making sure it's a, a good fit and the parents have uh, the ability to make it work? Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting question. And that for me has evolved over the years too. Uh, dry land for me now, it, well, uh, first of all, I think it gets a bad rap because too often it looks like drill sergeants. Uh, I, oh gosh, there's nothing that drives me more crazy than pulling up to a rink for a tournament or a league game. And you see the kids out in their lines and they're doing high knee raises and they're doing, you know, skips and and lunges and you're like these kids aren't engaged nobody is happy to be here so um my dry land looks just like my practices my dry land is full of small area games that ideally have problem solving components that will translate to on ice um uh, application variations of rugby uh touch rugby um are, are amazing at, um, we change the rules that, you know, you can only pass backward. Uh, you can, and then evolve that to, okay, um, you can only pass forward and then ask the kids, how did changing that rule, how did that change the way that you think about attacking? And so my dry land has evolved into, it's physical fitness because we, we have them running and, and doing things that I wish happened more organically in the neighborhood or, or on the playground. Um, but, but the game that we ask them to play is challenging uh, their mental capacity more, maybe even more than their physical capacity. And then how do we do that? We're find, a, find areas near rinks where uh, we can just say 30 extra minutes. We have an hour of ice. 
we'll leave our bags in the warming room and we'll be outside for 30 extra minutes. And if parents know that, ideally they actually get plugged into the schedule weeks in advance. But, um, you know, some have to go. They, we've got another activity to run to or what have you. Um, but uh, that's how I find it to be most effective, either right before or right after practice. And, and, and more kids want to come if it's, you know, we're, we're playing ultimate Frisbee or we're playing rugby or we're playing a, a variation of dodgeball or something like that, as opposed to push-ups and planks and, you know, and, and sit-ups. I got a funny story kind of uh, adding to that. So with the University of Akron, uh, we do a lot of like flag football without the flags, you know, just touch football and you'll see the other team doing plyos and the coach is doing the drill sergeant. And then we go out and play and we end up winning. It's like, I'm yeah. not sure the plyos did much for you there, but uh, right. just keep it fun. Get, like get that energy. In. And it's the biggest complaint I have when I go to a rink is watching the you know, three to 10 minute warm ups that every team has. And they all do the old pretzel and the Montreal passing circles. And there's no decision making being done yeah. at all. And I'm over here trying to like recreate the wheel and I'm getting pushback from like players. Like it just feels weird. I'm like, well, you've been doing it terribly for so many years. Of course it's going to feel weird. Yeah. I don't know. What, what do you, you think on that? that? No, we, I, <laughs> you would, you would crack up if you saw my last warm up. Um, we had five different stations going on. All our right wings had a puck and were battling on the right half wall uh, in our zone. The left wings in, on the left wall. The D were out in the neutral zone working on uh, skating forwards and backwards and, and touch passes with each other. And our centers were uh, working with the goalies on, on shots. So those, those were going on. So it's three stations. I mean, we get three minutes, but it's three more minutes of, of, development versus I look at the other end and a kid gets one or two Montreal's in and that's their three minutes and our kids you know are are battling and the refs always come over and just laugh they're like what is going on down here I'm like it's it, we got three minutes of practice before the game starts this is not a game warm-up this is taking advantage of every second of three hundred dollar ice I can take advantage of to have kids out there playing and having fun yeah, that's, that's where my mind sits at. It's like, these are minutes that could be used for somebody. At least, like, wake them up mentally. Because I don't know how many times coaches get upset because our team wasn't awake by the start of the game time. And then I look at the warm-up, and it's like, well, no duh. I, I've yeah. literally charted out the decisions and the puck touches, and here's the stats, and you can yeah. those numbers way up. Yeah. yeah. Rookie stuff. Right. So. But, but, but it's not. You know, we talked about it beforehand. That takes a lot of confidence as a coach when – Everybody's doing one thing. And I mean, imagine the pressure of 15 families from the other team watching your warm up and whether or not they're laughing at you. And if you're if you're not someone with uh, with a belief in something or for me, enough experience to where I'm not worried about that anymore. It's a pressure I remember all too well from 17 years ago. Um, I, my very first learn to play sessions, I look at those practice plans and it was all about me proving to the parents that their kids were in good hands. They were in lines. It was very regimented, very rigid. And I needed the parents to know how smart I was. Uh, shame on me, but, but it's completely understandable. And so to have the courage to do it like you do it, um, especially at a young age, is is very uh, exciting that the uh, normal coach doesn't have a whole lot of hockey experience still in this country. Uh, over half of our parents um, are, are first timers, meaning their kid is the first one in their family in any capacity to, uh, to be involved in the sport. And, and so we've got to recruit all these newbies all the time or we wouldn't have enough coaches. So um, of course they're going to do what, you know, what they look, and that team looks like they know what they're doing, but let's do what they do. No, here's, here's what we want you to do. And here's why. That's awesome. Um, and I know before we, we hopped on here, you were talking about uh, the message that you wanted to get across through this podcast episode. And I, I want to leave it open to exactly whatever you want to get across. I'm not going to bias the waters at all here. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I was, like I said before, I was kind of surprised to, to be, invited on it had been a while since anyone had um 
my content wasn't necessarily new. I, and, and, and just super briefly, USA Hockey was asked to present to Hockey Canada uh, at a provincial summit, Hockey uh, Alberta. They couldn't make it because they had internal meetings. And, and as a model association, they said, John, would you just go tell Kirkwood's story on behalf of USA Hockey? So I did that one. And then the next year, another province said, we love what your, your message last year to that group. Can you talk to us? That's, that's all that's out there. And again, just a volunteer who um, was silly enough to try and, and make a change, I guess. But um, with, with all of that as a background, I have absolutely zero credentials to, to be invited on a podcast. I, I'm not a professional in this industry. Uh, I didn't major in, in sports science or coaching. Um, I, I, I am simply a passionate volunteer who uh, is obsessed with trying to be better. And I think we have a lot of parents that are that way that just need the courage uh, or the encouragement to go, you know it, you know what's right, go ahead and, and make that change. Um, and so I wanna encourage parents, anyone who's listening, if, if you are just a normal person, you are every bit as qualified as the experts. And then the second thing that I, that I, that I wanna get at is, um, I think we focus too much on the very, uh, in respect to what you guys do, there's great stuff and I absorb it and read it and love it, but we focus a lot on the elite and the top of the pyramid at, at an individual age group or the entire pyramid. And um, we are always rushing to be the, the AP, high school AP science teacher. And frankly, not all the kids are gonna be in the high school AP science class. But every kid's going to have an amazing uh, or have a second or fourth or sixth grade teacher. Be that coach. Be the best coach for the, for the second grade class and the fourth grade class and the sixth grade class. If I'm making sense, we all remember that teacher in, in grade school that inspired us. And not everybody. <laughs> there you go. Shout out. Um, Mrs. Zollner for me. And uh, so. Um, we should all recognize that we may never be coaching tier one 18U hockey, but there is a desperate need for every 10 year old to have an amazing experience. And so let's, I, I just want, I, I want, I want more folks to just not be in such a rush to, to get to the really elite technical stuff. And, and, and spend more time being soaked in the basics and letting kids just get obsessed with this sport. Um, and if you can make them obsessed, there's a better chance that somewhere down the road, they're going to need that really elite training. We want more Coopers of the world. We want those kids that are lifers playing adult league. Uh, all the way through college and season ticket holders. Uh, those are some of my favorite people are the guys that are playing in the slacker league, even some girls that are playing in the slacker league and just having a ball with it. I, I totally agree. And I, and I will, I, and I'll say this, you know, I know I said it before, my, I'm, I'm not competing on the scoreboard. I'm competing uh, with that other coach. I'm competing with the, our kids favorite uh, twitchers with their favorite YouTubers I'm competing with their teachers at school. I want to be the most impactful adult in their life in a positive way uh, outside of their parents. And so I'm not worried about the score today. I, I, I want the coach who gets that player next year to have an impossible set of skates to fill. Um, and that comes from caring about the player and caring about the person. And that comes from remembering, I'm 51 years old. I love hockey. I don't play formally anymore. So does that mean the training that, that my favorite coach gave me is obsolete? It kind of does. But the life lessons that, that he learned or how he made me feel or the belief he instilled in myself, that stuff is, is until you're in the grave. And so if we could focus more on being the most impactful person in their life versus the best instructor of a Mohawk turn, um, I think we would be doing a, a larger swath of kids a heck of a lot more service. Uh, amen to that. So uh, hopefully all the listeners out there understanding why I wanted you to come on, because I think 
just this perspective much beyond the wins and losses is so important. Uh, not just the process of creating better players, but better people in general and continue to increase and strive for that level of excellence. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, hockey is a tool as other sports are to impart life lessons and life skills. Um, and if you go back to the history of why sporting clubs were started, it was almost all of them were around that idea of creating better people. So I, I love your message. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, and I agree. And, and it's it, it, the, the best way to create great people is to make them feel great. And, and so that doesn't happen from yelling. That doesn't happen from uh, being disappointed. It doesn't happen from being upset uh, about mistakes. It happens from just having more fun than anybody. And, and all that other stuff takes care of itself. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I know it's not always easy for people to take time out of their schedule, but really appreciate you coming on. Uh, two minutes if you have any plugs. Otherwise, thanks again for coming on. This was awesome. No, I, I, hope, uh, I hope people find value in it. Um, uh, I, if you want to share uh, contact information, I, I, it, it, is, it is amazing uh, that there are others out there like you that do some of that digging. And every six months or so, I'll get a, an email from someone with, with a question. I'm, I, I am so thankful for, for the mentorship that USA Hockey gave me and the thought of what it's done for hundreds, if not thousands of kids that, that we owe it to them to, to give back. So I, it, I'm, like I said, just a guy, but if anyone has a question or, or wants just the guy's opinion, uh, please don't hesitate to, to contact me. All right. Just a guy, John, thanks again for coming on. This was awesome. Take care. Thanks, Greg. Take care. Thank you for tuning into the Hockey IQ podcast. We are Hockey's Arsenal, Greg Rivak and Dan Ducart. Together, we've come together to create a platform and a community to expand our hockey intelligence, hockey IQ, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're very passionate about seeing this game played smarter and better and continue to develop itself uh, to the next level and staying on the cutting edge of things. So you can find us at Hockey's Arsenal on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We're also at hockeysarsenal.com. Uh, from there, you can find some resources and some options to work with us. We're excited to continue this. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, follow, and share. Uh, you can also join up for our newsletter as well, where we're going to tackle anything hockey iq related so we're excited to have everyone here and continue to build